uh, our agenda calls for us at 1 o'clock to um, have a session on criminal background checks. Uh, and particularly in this section, I want us to make sure we identify ourselves for those that are online uh, that are listening to our conversation. So to get it uh, started, we'll turn to our legal counsel, Katie Cornetta, to uh, uh, give us the background of where we are, and along with Superintendent Atkinson, to suggest some things that we possibly can do or that we can suggest to the legislature to consider. Um, this will be a discussion today. We won't take any action today or tomorrow. Uh, I plan to uh, turn this over to um, the operations, business operations committee that uh, has supervision over licensure working with uh, our chief financial officer. So uh, uh, Mr. Alcorn uh, will try to take this forward with uh, the assistance of the lieutenant governor who's taking the paper interest in this also. So um, Ms. Cornett. Thank you, Chairman and members of the State Board of Education. I am Katie Cornetto, the in-house counsel to the State Board of Education. Um, today, I'm following up on a presentation you had during the State Superintendent's Report from last month. And it has to do with a very important subject, which is criminal background checks for teachers before they become licensed in North Carolina. Um, it is important to note that at your table, you have a copy of the task force report that came to be um, from the state superintendents calling a group of 25 professionals from across North Carolina together to make recommendations on bolstering the licensure system in North Carolina with respect to moral character and fitness to teach. In our state, teachers are role models. And to that end, the school districts are charged with employing teachers. The state board on the other hand, is charged with licensing teachers. Our own Supreme Court has held that teachers are intended by parents, citizenry, and lawmakers alike to serve as good examples for their young charges. Their character and conduct may be expected to be above those of the average individual not working in so sensitive a relationship as that of teacher to pupil. It is not inappropriate or unreasonable to hold our teachers to a higher standard of personal conduct given the youthful ideals they are supported to foster and elevate. Additionally, our Supreme Court has held that under our Constitution, the State Board is vested with the authority to license teachers and other professionals. Consistent with your own goals, three and five, in your strategic plan, teachers must report and be screened for any misconduct before they are licensed to teach. Your own state board policies regulate the conduct of licensed teachers. All of that woven together gives you a unique opportunity when a teacher is licensed in our state to fill out an application and answer questions about their past. What we have most recently are several media reports, both from the national level and the local level, that draw into question some of the processes that we have been doing in North Carolina. I've included those links for your reference in the event you have not seen them yet. The concerns that were identified in those articles stem from a few. Fingerprint criminal background checks are not conducted by the state prior to issuing a license. When we issue a license in North Carolina, teachers have to answer questions about their past. And they have to be background checked by the local level prior to employment. Any criminal history on a teacher that is found at the local level gets sent to my office for review and consideration. Not every criminal not every criminal background, and not every 
alleged misconduct amounts to a denial or a revocation of license. It is very important to keep in mind that there are all sorts of human factors that play into someone's <laughs> past. That being said, one of the concerns that was raised by the media was that local criminal background check policies for employees vary from district to district across our state. That being said, there was in the, some of the reports, a patchwork approach to screening for bad actors in our schools. To top it off, there was a concern raised about limited information sharing with other states from North Carolina regarding licensure discipline actions taken. And NASDAQ, not to be confused with the stock market, um, is a, a national association of state directors of teacher education certification. Our local school districts to date do not have access to NASDAQ, but you'll hear about some plans to change that in the future. Just to recap from last week, the current law regarding criminal background checks by local board employers require local boards to have background check policies, and it further prohibits local boards from charging for those background checks. Some of our districts are using fingerprinting as their criminal background check. Some are using databases. So there is a variety among our school districts of approaches. And by and large, it comes down to cost. The proposed changes to law that we as a state board would need for our licensing authority is to change the law to allow for the state board conducting fingerprint checks. Once we were authorized to do that, we would require an agreement with the State, um, state Bureau of Investigation, um, and we would have to clearly outline the purposes with the background check results, that purposes that we would be using them for. Also, on our current application, we ask two important questions. Have you ever been convicted of a crime other than a minor traffic offense? And have you ever had a license suspended or revoked in another state? The proposed changes to licensure application questions are actually laid out in the task force report itself on pages 34 and 35. Getting additional self-reporting um, self from our teachers is important. One of the characteristics we rely on for teachers is that they're honest. And so self-reporting is, by and large, a very effective tool to find out about someone's past. What's also important to note is that these, if we move to a fingerprint criminal background check system from the state, the state would be the equalizer of a standard that we have set forth about those who have the character and fitness to teach in our state. The proposed recommendations that I bring to you today are to try to address some of the concerns that are immediately raised as well as to help bolster the system down the road. Number one recommendation would be to fingerprint criminal background checks prior to issuing a teacher a license. As I mentioned, it would require legislative and policy changes, a fingerprinting fee of $50 per teacher, and additional staffing resources at the state level. Um, in my meetings with the State Bureau of Investigation, they articulated that for every 10,000 fingerprint background check that they review, it's a full-time equivalent personnel. And when we talked about 52,000 teacher licenses, they said we would be adding to their staff by 5.2 people. That's something that would come as a result of legislative changes. The second proposed recommendation is to add application questions to improve the self-reporting process, which would require the modification to our application. And then NASDAQ access for districts. That's not something that's in your purview. But I did contact the executive director of NASDAQ and had a conversation with him. They're starting a pilot for school districts to participate in seeing this national register of former um, disciplinary conduct that was taken in any state for a teacher license. And um, I'm pleased to mention that Charlotte Mecklenburg School will be participating in that first ever national <coughs> pilot. From those, um, from the results of that pilot, 
It is the hope that by January of 2017 that NASDAQ would offer to all of our school districts access to the clearinghouse of information. The fourth, fourth proposed recommendation is to implement other things that were identified in the 17 recommendations that have been proposed by the task force. And that, I think, will take a little longer in time to uh, shape. Um, I think our personnel administrators of the state, with whom I talked yesterday, there were just 200 of them, um, are very much in favor of working together to find the best solution for our state and for the kids in our classroom. I'm happy to take any questions. I should do this. Clarification. Uh, Mr. Alcorn. On number one, the uh, estimation of the 5.2 FTE uh, for that, is that uh, doing 50,000 uh, background checks per year? Is it, uh, so the statistic that was given in the meeting is that we have 52,000 licensure applications that flow through the state per year. And um, th that made a big difference in the meeting about how they approached what was happening. It's very systematic for all licensing boards in our state to do this fingerprint criminal background check. We just have an inordinate amount, thankfully, of applications that come through annually. Those aren't renewals, those are new. I think it's all the ones that require processing on an annual basis, some new, some renewal. So the fingerprinting is suggested is for renewals as well as new. That would be correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Cobb, so you used to call him Mr. Hill. Separated at first, okay, Mr. Cobb. Well, I think, I'm, I think that um, we need to be concerned, coming from a district that probably has put more bad teachers, criminal teachers in jail than any other district in the state, I would imagine. It's been my misfortune on, on, on the local board. Um, the thing that we found in trying to put together a profile for these teachers is that they, it's the same profile as a teacher of the year. Oftentimes, these people don't have a record at all. Um, and uh, the, the number of folks that have been arrested for any kind of abuse um, fit that category. And so, any kind of screening that we're getting on teacher discipline like this is not apt to really <clears throat> take care of our main problem. Um, we did background checks extensively after we were hit with uh, some pretty egregious examples of, of uh, misconduct and really found very rarely that we ever come up with anything from fingerprints or the paid background checks to do that. Uh, I think that we need a standardization for the state. I don't have a problem with that. I question whether fingerprints are what they used to be. Um, we all can get on a program called Intellius and find out everything about each other here as we're sitting here, uh, down the bank accounts and all kinds of other stuff. So I, I think there is probably a better way of, of, a, of, of assessing, accessing that information than just a SBI background of fingerprint check, but I'm not an expert in that, and I think we need to look at, at folks and ask that question, and then I think we need to be funding the locals at some level to do it, uh, because ultimately these people are their employees, they're the ones who are recruiting them, they're the ones who are responsible once they hire them, and I think it's our responsibility to put together a system that is uniform across the state, and, and that's the takeaway I got from the articles that we have. Uh, we can have comments too. Uh, Dr. Atkins. The legislation does talk about policies. However, to get to the consistency that Mr. Collins is talking about, it would require a legislative change um, to make that possible. And uh, Ms. Cornett, I think it would be interesting or good information to share with the group about the process <coughs> that is followed in the department and with the state board when we find a person who has been convicted of a criminal offense and how many that have been disciplined over the years. So over the years, over 800, I'm sorry, 800 licenses have had disciplinary action. 
Um, information comes to us from a variety of sources. School districts um, have a mandatory reporting rule for suspected physical and sexual abuse of a student. Um, there's media reports. There's reports that come um, from parents and other teachers who may see alleged wrongdoing. When we get those inquiries in my office, um, I ask for a detailed explanation from the individual who's being accused of misconduct, and based on the review of that documentation and any other relevant court documents, we determine whether or not that person should have nothing done to his or her license, be denied a license, or come in for an interview with the Ethics Committee, which the State Superintendent has an Ethics Advisory Committee that meets monthly. We have about 12 to 14 interviews once a month of people who've been accused of alleged misconduct. And after those interviews are over, the committee makes a recommendation to the state superintendent about how to handle the individual circumstances. It is a highly effective process that we have used and it is touted nationally among colleagues of my own when we talk about how we make our, um, our process work for kids and for teachers. Um, this is Bill Covey. I, I guess I have a series of questions that maybe can't be answered, but maybe the committee could consider. Mm -hmm. Like, we have public charter schools too. You know, how can we handle that? We have far, an increasing number of farm teachers coming from other countries to teach in our classroom. Uh, why do we have to do fingerprint tests on people who are already in the system teaching or are subject to renewal? That, that doesn't, it sounds like, I mean, I would think there could be some kind of grandfather. Also, I think there's a difference in an applicant being forwarded to us from an LEA or from a charter school than someone who just wants a North Carolina license. And I understand we have a number of applicants who maybe never intend to teach. I know I got a real estate license dec decades ago with no intention of ever being a realtor. And uh, so, but it's a nice thing to have in your pocket, <laughs> one of these licenses of, of any sort. So, I wonder, as we consider this, why should the state cover a fee of someone from Alaska that applies for a teaching license in our state because they think one of these days they might want to teach in our state as opposed to one who's applied at an LEA or a charter school. And uh, it's, it's a real hire that we're dealing with. So, there's just so many questions, and I, I think I've just touched on a few. Um, I think your questions are very valid. I think you also know that a North Carolina license for a teacher means something, and with my own personal experience with applying for a license to, to be an attorney, I actually paid the cost. I did the pre-work, and I applied to the bar, and they passed judgment over me after doing their extensive search. The bar application is 40 pages. And then there's thing, fingerprinting, and then they talk to everybody I know and don't know about me. So the point is for teachers to self-report their past and for us to cross-check with a fingerprint criminal background check, that's what we're looking for in terms of moving forward. And I think that what you're bringing up about the foreign teachers, about those who are working in charter schools who don't have a license, I think all of those issues are very paramount for us to consider as we move forward. I was trying to prime the pumps. <laughs> and it, uh, Ms. Taylor. Well, I don't know where to begin, but, um, you know, there's the whole, you know, do you charge teachers more? You know, they're already paying for their education, blah, 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 blah. But, I mean, if you're talking about $50, and this could be a career that they're going into, and we're thinking of our students who we do hear there's a lot of misconduct in. And if we're the licensing agency, are we negligent if we didn't find that out before we gave them a license? Um, and then the other thing is the fact that there's only two questions or whatever, um, maybe we also need to dig a little bit deeper 
and and ask them some other questions because sometimes you can answer the questions and it doesn't reveal some behind the scenes stories. I, I just feel like this is an important area. Um, you know, I, I, I realize that the funding either would have to come somewhere else, because I know we don't have it in our budget, or we look at the $50 as a, another cost. If you're going to become a licensed teacher, a professional that, you know, is in a field that's working with children, then this is something you're investing in. And I feel certain that Mr. Alcorn has done the math on 52,000 times $50, $2.6 million annually. That certainly is um, a big consideration um, for the state. And for individuals who want to become teachers, I think the expectation is by and large, that their backgrounds are checked and that their license does mean something, that they are fit to be role models for our students. Uh, Ms. Wellman. That number just astounds me that they're 52,000, that they're 52,000 annually. So total, I believe there's 100 to 125,000 in the state that are licensed. Right. But what we touch annually, whether it's an add-on of an area, whether it's initial license, whether it's reciprocity, whether it's renewal, um, th that's the number that was quoted to me from the department. And um, I, I definitely we can dig deeper on what that actually means. Well, just as we try to project what the cost is going to be, I think that's certainly important. And where the $50 goes, um, I know you said the SBI gave you some figure for how many additional employees they would need. And I think the other question, uh, to your point, as a licensed attorney, um, there are other states where you could move and be licensed by paying a fee. Um, and so do we have, when we look at other states, you mentioned the NASTEC um, you know, database. I, I assume it's like with lawyers here, we can go to another state and be licensed without, and it's not all 50 states, I get that, but we don't accept all 50 states either. But yes, I, I think there are a lot of questions, um, Chairman Heavy, to your point, and maybe we need to sneak them as we mold this and think of them send them, but I think the, the number of what we do with other states, is it for renewal or is it just initial licensure to your point? Um, I think there are a lot of questions around this. And where the, where the $50 is. Mr. McDevitt? Uh, yes, uh, uh, just a comment that I, and I will look forward to Mr. Alcorn's committee's uh, consideration of each of these recommendations and and the recommendations then back to this board and and perhaps even updating it to the degree that that makes sense in terms of other due diligence that might be uh, recommended <clears throat> and uh, and uh, a lot of <clears throat> these comments with power expressed here uh, would also encourage that the work align with the work of the policy recommendations that we received a week or two or a month or two ago about licensure changes that included decoupling licensure from the offer of hiring because there's a there's a distinction of the hiring practice and the licensure but they're still linked uh, so that seems to me to be something that uh, and then let's face it we've got a licensure backup a serious backup that uh, the, the superintendent is keeping us informed about but that too should be a consideration as part of that and then uh, Finally, I guess this is a question to the chair. Do you anticipate uh, those places where that would require statutory change? Do you anticipate uh, there being recommendations uh, for the short session uh, that begins before we meet again? But it doesn't end before we meet again. But uh, there are some statutory changes that uh, are part of this that are part of the consideration. And some of that, of course, is last year. Well, Mr. McDevitt, <clears throat> That's why I referred to the Lieutenant Governor, because I think he's taken a special interest in this and that he may be working with the staff of the General Assembly to come up with some legislative proposal. So uh, in that regard, of course, I'm asking uh, our legislative liaisons and uh, Mr. Alcorn and his committee to engage the Lieutenant Governor so that we all can 
pretty much stay on the same page as we go forward. And Good. of course, he doesn't need our authorization to get a sponsor over in the General Assembly, but it always works better when we're conferring. Okay. So if you're looking for a timetable from our committee, we'll, we'll do it before the next meeting, uh, our next meeting, and most likely the next week. Today. Yes, right. Okay. So we'll. We'll look forward to some sort of feedback uh, at our next board meeting. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you, Mr. Alcorn. Any other comments from our advisors and such? <laughs> uh, hearing none, uh, thank you, Ms. Courtney.